Well, a uh, very good uh, afternoon and thank you for joining us for this event at which EY will take us through the key findings of their uh, new research, shaping the future of uh, borderless work towards uh, a new model for cross-border remote working. And the research is by EY in partnership with the City of London Corporation. My name is Keith Bottomley and I'm Deputy Chairman of the City Corporation's Policy uh, Committee. Uh, and it's my pleasure uh, to be your host for this uh, event this afternoon. Just a few words, the inevitable words of housekeeping, really important though. Um, let's get that out of the way first. Please be aware that today's event is being recorded and may be shared on our digital platforms uh, in the future. Uh, please post any questions that you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And please do specify a panelist if you want me to direct your question uh, in a particular way. If you have any technical issues at all, please post uh, your query uh, again in the chat uh, and the technical team will uh, do their best to assist you. So let's begin. Um, so why has the City uh, of London Corporation partnered with EY to produce uh, this research? Well, as the voice uh, of the UK's uh, financial and professional sector, the City Corporation aims to promote and maintain London and the UK's uh, position as the leading FPS centre in the world, and in doing so to strengthen the UK's competitiveness on uh, the global stage. Now, undoubtedly, the topic of remote working has recently risen to become a vital issue uh, in this agenda. We've all witnessed uh, the increasing trend and demand for cross-border remote working in recent years, and this trend poses both challenges and opportunities for UK financial services. On the one hand, we want firms to be able to offer the flexibility that global mobile talent demands today. On the other, we need to retain the benefits of financial and professional services sectors clustering in one place. Uh, with this research, uh, we seek to explore how firms and policymakers can navigate these conflicting priorities and to plot uh, a path going forward. Earlier this year, we published a research bank benchmarking London against other leading financial centres, and it found that London remained the most competitive centre overall, but was lagging in some areas. For example, London came third in terms of access to talent and skills. It trailed Singapore, which has a deep uh, talent pool of digital skills, and also trailed uh, New York City, uh, which is becoming more attractive again to international talent. So this just uh, indicates how, despite the UK's enduring strengths in financial and professional services, uh, it can't afford to be at all complacent. So we need to work hard to make ourselves more attractive to international talent, capital and businesses. Clearly the pandemic induced explosion in remote working is a reality which is not going to go away. And we all need to understand how best to respond to that new world. And as you'll see, other jurisdictions are beginning to take advantage of this trend and the UK cannot afford to be left behind. Part of the City Corporation's response to the pandemic recovery is a major new campaign called Destination City, which is an ambitious programme to reimagine the square mile as a world leading destination for workers, visitors and residents with a £2.5 million annual investment. It will deliver outdoor festivals featuring music and sport in the city's iconic settings and hidden spaces. And in fact, the campaign kicks off with an event called the Golden Key this coming Saturday. Uh, the Golden Key will transform the city's streets into a large scale programme of immersive events with theatre, participatory games and performances of all ages. So I can't resist the opportunity for an effort here. Uh, if you're in London or in close to the city on Saturday afternoon, please do come along and join us. It will be very special. It goes on until the early evening. So our belief uh, is that by boosting our cultural offering, which is why we're doing this, uh, it will diversify the city's economic base, uh, leaning into uh, the historical assets from our past to make us more resilient in the future. 
So in summary, we hope that this research, um, we can explore the opportunities through it, uh, the cross-border remote working offers. Uh, there is the potential that cross-border remote working helps keep talent in the UK uh, or attract new talent uh, to work for UK-based firms. So I'll now hand over to Dr. Seema Farazi, uh, Financial Services and Immigration Partner at EY. And Seema will take us through the main findings and recommendations of the research. And this is a preview uh, of the findings and we'll email the details to everybody in a few days time. Uh, Seema, over to you. Thank you so much, Keith, and um, very honoured to be partnering with you on this really important report. Um, do we have the slides? I can't see them, but I'm not sure if anybody else is able to see. Ah, there we go. Um, so this, uh, this, this piece of work is a very timely follow up to the joint report that we did um, with the City of London Corporation and the City UK, which was published last year which talked about our cross-border remote work and the emerging challenges that UK employers were facing around the accelerated phenomenon that it presented, um, and in particular, the administrative burden uh, that sat beside it. At that time, we said that it was going to be important to keep a close eye on these developments and to um, be thinking about what reforms or reviews might be necessary. And I think we're all really delighted that we are now seeing the right heads turning to this issue um, over the course of the project um, that we've been working on this year. And the paper, of course, lands at a time when policymakers are really coming to the table to consider what interventions are appropriate or are required to address gaps in the frameworks surrounding cross-border remote work. Now, this, um, if we just look on one side, uh, this notice notably includes a uh, UK government evidence base uh, review, which will examine the tax and social security impl implications for companies and employees that, that arise from working across borders. Um, and of course, that, that evidence gathering is also going to look at the role of digital nomad visas um, attracted uh, globally that are offered to attract workers globally. And we talk about that in our report, too. We have a very successful track record um, of partnering uh, with the City of London Corporation on policy. Um, if we just click on one slide, we can look at some of our previous reports. Um, we have um, managed to um, secure a kind of sensible reforms around immigration policy, um, the scale up route, short term mobility, which many of you will know that the Prime Minister spoke about uh, last week. And what we really attribute that to is, um, of course, extensive research, sector insight, uh, cross subject matter expertise. But more importantly, um, I would say really understanding the challenges that policymakers face, um, the need to balance um, against uh, public integrity, public accountability, and the need to really present practical, controlled, pragmatic policy tweaks recognizing that often the quick wins are as important as the big picture reforms. We engaged extensively uh, in formulating the recommendations and doing our um, evidence gathering for this report. Uh, we're extremely grateful if we move on one slide um, to everybody that we engage with throughout the, the process, including um, uh, our distinguished panelists. Uh, we spoke to world leading academics on the future of work and really tried to bring together the whole puzzle of cross border remote work in one, one piece. Now, we wanted to really track the journey of cross border remote work. What was it like pre pandemic? Where might it go in the future? And really dissect the personas that are in the cross border remote work pool um, and build up a spectrum um, to understand what responses are required for different parts of that spectrum. So in the report, we identify 11 cross-border remote working personas, and we focus on the report on those that are most aligned to the employer-employee relationship. We recognize that there are lots of digital nomad and freelance trends, um, which are important to, to differentiate in the report, but really our focus is on the employee-employer impact. There has obviously uh, been... Um, uh, a lot of movement around demand um, and also supply of cross-border remote work and uh, reluctance as well from risk stakeholders within organizations um, and really um, a, a lack of understanding as to whether this is going to be a long-term um, pivot or whether it is actually simply a pandemic response. So we really wanted to challenge in the report whether cross-border remote work um, was going to move away from the margins into the mainstream um, and really test the why. 
um, is there a need for a sustainable and ambiguous infrastructure before we actually jumped into what that could look like? Now, um, no surprise, given that we're all here talking about it, that we concluded there is a very pressing need. Um, Keith has spoken to, it, uh, to some of the key challenges from a UK competitiveness perspective. And what we say in the report really is that employer and geostrategic trends have really converged to amplify pressure around uh, globally agile working models um, in the report we walked through. Why? Now, if we move on to, to start to look at some of the, some of the trends that we identify, um, uh, and this will not be a surprise to, to anybody on this call, but um, cross-border remote work, of course, was not created by the pandemic, but, but largely accelerated. It existed before, it sat on the margins of mobility, but largely without any structure, both from an operational perspective and from a governmental framework perspective. Um, we've seen kind of ebbs and flows where uh, we've gone from a crisis response in the pandemic to um, employee expectation really building and driving this into an employee-led uh, mobility space. Um, and we've seen the crisis response need um, again accelerate with the war in Ukraine um, and suddenly displaced employees, uh, creating both an employee need but also an employer need um, to actually be able to have people working in places where they find themselves. Um, and that need, we say, arises from three irresistible forces of change. Um, so if we flick on uh, one slide, please. And of course, the, relevant, the relative weight of these forces is going to be in flux at any given point in time, whether it's crisis response, long term strategy. But one thing that we observed throughout when we're looking at cross border remote work, either as a pandemic or a geostrategic response or cross border remote work as an employee driven form of mobility, um, putting humans at the centre of the approach uh, from an employer perspective, whether that's looking at safety, well-being, talent retention, talent attraction, was really, really critical um, to um, ensuring uh, the, the right level of competitiveness and the right level of, of welfare. We've seen um, a real shift in employee expectations. Um, you will all know that the pandemic, of course, accelerated a work realignment that was already in progress. Um, we there's a lot of data in the report that the evidence is this 72% of employers are considering or have implemented a policy to, to enable work from another location. 74% of employers are looking at broader talent pools um, with hard to fill or critical skills and um, being filled uh, almost in any geography. And we've seen this rapid adoption of remote working technology uh, really loosen the link between job and geography. And that's something that, that really comes out uh, from the research that many of the stakeholders um, uh, have already done, uh, including uh, some of our uh, panelists today. When we put that into an employee perspective, 80% of employees say that they want to work remotely at least uh, two days a week. And uh, there's a very interesting uh, article, there's, there's a lot that's written on this, but particularly um, uh, telling, I thought this title was uh, Work From Home Is Loved Worldwide, even though Wall Street is uh, struggling with it or it dislikes it. And nine out of 10 employees are searching for that flexibility in when and where they work. Now, this workforce rebalancing is really further fueling an already uh, challenging race for talent. And in the report, we look at research around the great resignation, the great reshuffle, all pointing to this being a very, very real set of circumstances in which employees are competing for talent. 44% of employees are now defining themselves as active job seekers. 43% are saying that they're likely to leave the, their employer in the next year. 68% um, of employers are saying that their employee turnover has increased in the last 20, uh, in the last 12 months, sorry. Um, and 90% of employers in the UK are hiring for new roles in 2022. And uh, those that are planning to offer fully remote work, uh, which is 76%, have the greatest level of confidence in their ability to hire. ONS data as well points to um, uh, lowest um, unemployment records, uh, so 1.2 uh, persons per vacancy, 3% of jobs in the EU unfilled, um, 0, 0 0.6 unemployed persons per job opening in the US in August 2022. And it's telling that all of that is leading um, CEOs um, to really consider uh, scarcity and the cost of attracting and retaining talent as a key impediment to growth, 29% uh, of CEOs rate it as um, a key concern. Now we talked about uh, cross-border remote work arising from um, 
the pandemic or rather being accelerated by the pandemic. And again, we saw that that acceleration uh, again happened uh, around circumstances um, from the war in Ukraine. And recent levels of geopolitical disruption are presenting quite significant challenge in the pres present context. And there are multiple disruptive forces uh, shaping the global operating environment for employers, includes climate change, technological innovation, skills shortages, demographic shifts. And a lot of the leading academics that we spoke to argue that these frictions of geographic mobility, as they call them, can actually be solved by a more inclusive work from anywhere approach. And the final uh, force that we talk about in the report is really um, workforce transformation. And a recent Gartner research uh, points to workforce being one of the top three strategic priorities for CEOs after growth in tech, up from fifth. 32% of CEOs are reshaping their op operations to mitigate threats by adopting new working models and talent strategy to better attract and retain employees. And 72% of executives say that they believe they have to radically transform um, in order to compete effectively in their industry. So employees are increasingly leaning in um, and looking at strategic uh, talent as uh, almost a transformational opportunity, uh, allowing them to potentially access critical skills from a wider geography, enhancing the diversity of their workforces with more equitable access to global talent. Uh, many of the people that we spoke to talked about um, opening up opportunities whilst reducing brain drain um, and also reducing carbon footprint associated with traditional forms of work or mobility. Now, um, if we move on to the context into which all of that arises, um, the operating framework for cross-border remote work is largely non-existent. Um, and what we find is that there is a, a, across all of the areas where um, cross-border remote work impacts from a regulatory perspective, um, there is um, in every single aspect a glaring gap, um, which is making it incredibly difficult for employers to deliver the flexibility to keep themselves competitive for talent whilst remaining compliant and without incurring um, unnecessary administrative burden. And what the stakeholders that we spoke, spoke to during our research really sought most uh, was clarity and simplification. And uh, of course, in the report, we're talking about a UK approach, but we're also looking at what can be, uh, what is the space for the UK to lead innovation from a multilateral level? Uh, there is a section of the report that talks about global snapshots of best practice. So where have policymakers stepped in to do something that is truly innovative in this space and what, what is their driving factor? Um, and what we talk about really is a, a pragmatic approach that enables UK employers to really maximise the socioeconomic benefits that CBRW uh, presents. Now, in the report, we summarise all of the challenges um, and we discuss um, the three factors, uh, three factors that we see are bringing policymakers to the table around uh, talent attraction. Uh, some are, are coming at this from a defensive position um, and others are looking at this as an opportunity to really bring um, economic development into local economies. Now, moving on then to the areas um, of reform, and I should say sorry on this slide, and um, this is probably one of the most telling statistics and it talks to that lack of clarity, that 96% of stakeholders that we spoke to in this process um, said that they felt it was upon the government to really take some action to support UK employers with the levels of complexity that they were seeing. Now, um, what are those complexities arising from? So let's move on one slide. Immigration, corporate tax compliance, social security, access to healthcare, employment law, personal employment, personal and employment tax, all create very significant challenges. And in the report, we go through these um, methodically um, to understand what has been, what is the challenge, um, what has been done in this space already, where is the gap, and what is a sensible and pragmatic way for policymakers to start thinking about filling it. And I think it's important to also call out that this is a fast evolving um, world uh, that we're in um, and certainly things are not remaining static and whilst um, there are some kind of core findings that we think necessitate a sustainable infrastructure it's very important to retain some kind of fluidity as um, as we develop into the next kind of uh, two to five to ten years. Let's talk about immigration first of all. Um, and uh, 
I'm going to hand over once I've talked about immigration, if it's a common slide, we're then going to go into corporate tax. Um, so the problem with immigration is that, as, as many of, of you will know on this session, is that it's, it's almost like a red a line. And if uh, right to work isn't present, then cross-border remote work just simply cannot happen. And the problem has been that remote work across borders, um, there is no neat immigration category into which it sits. It's not intercompany transfers, as that category is presently known. Um, there is no generally permitted category that allows a cross-border remote work as a visitor. And this has meant that it really falls into something of an immigration policy black hole. Um, and immigration systems generally treat uh, cross-border remote work in one of four ways. So they expressly prohibit it, they permit it through a nomad visa, um, they permit it only where incidental. So for example, in the UK, um, somebody who's coming into the UK as a business visitor will be able to do some incidental uh, remote work, but they cannot come to the UK for the purposes of remote working. And there are those rules that are just ambiguous. They say nothing, or in one place they point to a, a yes, and in another place they point to a no. Now in the report, we look at nomad routes. Um, and what we say about nomad routes is that while they are um, a very good example of speedy innovation, and that's something that we saw in immigration policy across the board, they're simply not designed for employers and therefore support really only a small subset of mobility requests that we see on cross-border remote work. So they're not a fix for most employee-led mobility requests, which tend to be quite short-term in nature, whereas a number of nomad at roots are uh, based on encouraging um, individuals to spend a, a particular amount of time in an economy. So when we look at immigration policy, visitors um, is the key gap. And this is where we say is the best way forward for policymakers. It's also the path of least resistance in terms of building up the right infrastructure where you can have that convergence between employee and employer led short-term movement, which is not a trend that we've uh, previously seen. Now, we reviewed uh, in the report immigration rules across 40 countries with key business travel aims for the UK in the sector against the approaches that we've just talked about. And the data that that throws up is really, um, it really shows how, how stark the challenges for business. Now, there are only 5% of countries in those key travel lanes that will explicitly permit remote work when entering the country as a visitor. 52% strictly prohibit it. 43% are in the gray and do not define or provide clarity. And as a result of that, employers are spending um, significant resources in order to stay on the right side of those uh, grey uh, lines. Now, um, visitor rules globally will need to evolve to recognise cross-border remote work as a permitted remote worker, uh, remote work visitor activity in itself. Um, and that's one of the key recommendations um, of the report around immigration. Um, visit activities are not fit for the world that we're living in at the moment. They have not moved or kept up pace. Uh, they've not kept up uh, with the pace of change that we've seen in the future of work. And it's a, it's a quick win. It's easily deliverable from the UK perspective, and it can be negotiated from a global perspective. The appropriate controls can be put in place, whether it's limiting the amount of time uh, that can be spent in that kind of category. But it would provide significant relief and clarity to businesses who are competing for talent and uh, expending resources um, where those resources could be best utilised elsewhere. Um, we're going to come on to corporate tax now, Fazan. I'm going to hand over to you to walk us through um, some of the most complex challenges um, that, that you and the team have worked through in the paper. Thank you, Seema. Um, so yeah, as, as Seema says, corporate taxes are also an area where um, there's an increased amount of risk. And that risk is, is a little bit different because if you think of a, a large organisation, that risk will predominantly sit within the group tax function, whereas most of the other risks that, uh, that Seema is going through have some sort of human resources aspect to them as well. Um, and, and the main challenge we see is the fact that we have this new way of working um, and, and the rules that we need to apply from a corporate income tax perspective are very dated. Um, so if we think of the definition um, permanent of, of permanent establishment, that term was first used in, in 1885 and has largely been in its current guise since 1954. Um, but for all the reasons we've just heard from SEMA, now is certainly the time for change. Um, and the main changes are the fact that we have a bigger services sector across the world. Um, and we also need to take into account the fact that, you know, since COVID, remote working is becoming um, an increased reality. 
Um, ultimately, these changes will need to be at a global level, but unilaterally, the UK could start with measures, um, not least because in the vast majority of cases, it will be UK employees that are seeking to work, work elsewhere. And so if we look at the narrow impact to the UK exchequer for inbound workers, that ought to be, relatively speaking, quite small. And so in terms of sort of clear recommendation or, or easy wins, as we put it in the report, um, we think that there's a lot more that could be done to increase certainty and consistency for organisations. Um, the main area would be around having more objective tests as opposed to the very subjective tests that we have to work with. Um, and the second is looking at the impact of if you have a, a particular tax issue. So the main issue is creating um, inadvertent permanent establishments and, and the rules are pretty black and white. You either have a, a PE or you don't have a PE and the, the compliance sort of follows depending on which route um, you go down. But actually having some more simplified reporting and administration could be helpful in that context. Um, and so, yeah, what we said set out in this slide is, is effectively, you know, different ways in which the UK could um, use its um, use its power to effectively ensure that um, there is change in 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 the context of uh, corporate income, both from a multilateral perspective and also looking domestically. And we'll, we'll touch on some of those um, a bit later today. But also, the report sets these out in a in a more uh, detailed format. Seema, I'll hand over to you to cover the rest of the risks. Thanks, Suzanne. And uh, some of them are, are pretty heavy reading, I think it's fair to say. So we, we will not go into the details, but there are um, six very key recommendations there that are uh, directed towards policymakers and we think pragmatic um, ways forward. Now, the same, of course, applies for personal and employment um, tax. There are noisy rules, um, but again, it's an area where tax rules do need to evolve to provide more clarity for business and simplify administration. And um, the, the engagement with business advisors through the businesses and advisors through the recent review on hybrid work, hybrid and remote work by the government is a very welcome first step and kind of incorporating this into HMRC guidance and examples is, is going to be critical to address the current uncertainty. There are five key features that we identify in the report that, that need to um, uh, the policy makers need to focus on is uh, so agreement on the definition of short term versus medium to long term, defining source of employment income from a geographical perspective, determination of personal tax residents, um, of whether employees are based in a country such the employee has to pay tax where they work, even if they're only there for quite a short period of time, and uh, employment tax withholding obligations. And we identify four ways to move forward. Um, some of which are around um, extension of uh, definitions and provide provision of guidance um, and allowing the extension of, of certain arrangements um, that we present in the corporate tax perspective across to the employment tax perspective. Now I'm, I'm whizzing through this because um, I've been told I've got a less than five minute warning now to, to wrap up this section before we get into the discussion. Um, Social security. Um, the international social security system, of course, it should broadly be supportive of cross-border remote working. Um, however, what we've seen in the report is that um, the variability of the different personas, and again, those 11 personas are really critical in understanding those, those pressure points, together with the loose framework of the system, often points to another view um, by requiring contributions to be made in one jurisdiction where the employee may actually prefer them to be in another. Um, and many bilateral social security agreements are in fact structured on the basis of international assignments rather than more agile ways of working. Um, these, we say, do not always produce uh, sensible outcomes when the fact, pa fact patterns really point to a different um, conclusion. And uh, we identify a number of areas where um, the UK government could work with co-signatories and bilateral totalization agreements to, to deliver more sensible outcomes to simplify the processes um, unilaterally in the UK and provide more clarity to employers um, in the context of some of the social security challenges that present. The, um, the last area that we look at in the report is employment law. Um, and in employment law, we focus on, if we just move um, one slide, oh, we've done it, right. Um, the lack of harmonization, um, we, we've seen this in the research with discussions with stakeholders. There, there is a real concern about what is going to happen with areas where there is assumed risk uh, from a business, but no regulatory framework at the time that, that risk has been assumed. Um, is there going to be a wave of enforcement action that sits around that in a few years' time? Is there going to be a wave of, of uh, disputes 
And um, employment law is an area where there is significant deviation across um, authorities in terms of minimum salary rules, minimum statutory holiday entitlements, sick leave entitlements and restrictions on working hours, um, whether the employing entity uh, can or should remain a UK entity. Um, and so future changes to, to those policies need to focus on a greater harmonization, um, duty of care, um, how and when risk assessments are going to be carried out, access to state healthcare, training, implications for future workforce planning, and issues around termination, and what are the rights that need to be considered from a termination perspective. And no doubt we'll get into an interesting discussion shortly about whether there should be a specific remote work um, persona in employment law, which is um, uh, something that we do not uh, recommend in the report, um, but where there is uh, quite a lot of very interesting debate um, uh, amongst uh, stakeholders. Um, so we've identified here a, a few actions that, that need to be considered from an employment law perspective. And just moving forward very quickly, um, we will be publishing this report, um, we expect, uh, next week. And you will see all of the very detailed recommendations in there. Um, now, we will have engaged with many of you very closely already in this process, but this is a, a, a continued dialogue. As we said, that even once the report is published, this is not going to remain um, static for very long. Um, so we're very, very interested um, to hear your views and your thoughts, and particularly when we look at the risk areas, are there any areas that you would like us to, to talk about that we haven't uh, done so far? Uh, and the executive summary that, that kind of summarizes our key findings is going to be emailed um, over to you all shortly. I'm going to stop there um, and hand back uh, to you, Keith. Uh, that's great. Thanks uh, very much indeed, Seema and uh, Fezan as well. There's a lot uh, to dig into there. So it's great to have such a uh, fantastic panel uh, with us. I'm just going to ask them to briefly introduce uh, themselves to you now. Uh, first of all, David. Thanks very much, Keith. I'm David Bradbury, the head of the Tax Policy and Statistics Division at the OECD. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, in the uh, coming weeks, I'll be uh, stepping up to be the Acting Deputy Director of the Centre for Tax Policy and Administration. Uh, but my team has been working on uh, a range of uh, issues connected with uh, the challenges of cross-border remote work. Thanks, David. Uh, Mohammed. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Keith. Uh, yeah, I work as a policy advisor at the Office of the Minister of State for Foreign Trade, also the Minister in charge of Talent Attraction Retention under the umbrella of the UAE Ministry of Economy. I lead the development of strategy and public policy in the field of economic migration of skilled human capital, also development of talent attraction retention programs and initiatives on a UAE federal level. Uh, I had the pleasure of advising EY in the City of London on the UAE's experience and response with cross-border remote working during the drafting of the research, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Great uh, to have you with us, Mohammed. Um, Jiga. Hi, I'm Chigo Fikad. I'm Head of Productivity and Innovation Policy at the Tony Blair Institute, and I've been leading all our work on how technology is reshaping the future of work. Thanks very much, Chigo. Jennifer. Thanks, Keith, and good afternoon. Um, I'm Jennifer, Deputy Director uh, at the CBI on employment issues, uh, issues related to the changing world of work, the labour market and the workforce. Um, the CBI represents uh, businesses uh, cross-sector that um, uh, collectively make up about a third of the private sector workforce in the UK. Thanks, Jennifer. Nick. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Keith. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Nick Lee. I head up regulatory and government affairs for Oak North. Uh, Oak North is both a bank in the UK. We lend predominantly to small and medium sized businesses and leverage uh, advances in technology to do that efficiently and effectively. And we sell that technology to other banks around the world to help them lend to uh, small and medium sized businesses as well. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. And you've already seen Fezan, but just to introduce yourself properly, Fezan. Keith. Um, so my name is Fezan Ismail. I'm a director in the international tax team at EY. 
Um, I advise um, all clients in all of the financial services sectors on how to deal with remote workers from a corporate income tax perspective, including sort of where your workers are, how to make sure you've um, determined the PE threshold in threshold given what's actually happened. Fantastic. What a great looking panel. Let's get stuck into the uh, conversation. So um, you'll see there's a little prompt uh, to put any questions uh, into the uh, Q and A box, which is down at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to start with David. David, so look, looking back in 2020, 2021, the OECD released updated guidance on the issues faced by cross-border employees and their employers around permanent uh, establishment and taxation. And I think the guidance was driven by the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, wasn't it, on customary work patterns and business practices. Could you just talk us through the main challenges that the OECD covered in, in its guidance? Sure, thanks very much, Keith. And look, uh, a couple of uh, preliminary words about the guidance itself. So um, the OECD can express its views on how tax treaties should be interpreted, but uh, obviously uh, uh, that's ultimately a matter based on the facts and circumstances of the case. Uh, but it's, uh, I think it, it was significant when the OECD did issue its guidance in the, uh, in the height of the, the pandemic. And uh, what we did in issuing that guidance was we, we not only sought to express uh, our view, but we drew upon um, much of the guidance that had already been put out by member countries and, and pulled that together in a way that I think um, gave people uh, somewhere to, to go into a central place to, to get a sense of how the treaty provisions would play out. In terms of the, the areas that we focused in on, the, the main areas of concern, I, I'd group them in three categories, if you like. I'd start with concerns around uh, the creation of a permanent establishment, PE concerns. I'd talk about um, concerns around uh, residents being triggered. Uh, and I'd talk about um, some specific concerns relating to income from employment. And so if we, we just, uh, start to talk our way through those, those elements. In terms of the PE, as, as we've already heard, there is uh, uh, always uh, this question of uh, whether or not uh, an enterprise is taxable in a jurisdiction. Uh, it, uh, it's it, the, the nexus or the taxing right that can arise for that jurisdiction can be triggered if a permanent establishment uh, exists in that jurisdiction. And one of the key questions here is when employees are working uh, in another country, uh, perhaps in a, a home office context, for example. Uh, certainly that was the case in the pandemic where travel restrictions were such that people were not necessarily able to, to return to their workplace if they had been traveling abroad. Uh, then there is this question of whether or not a PE uh, may have been triggered. Now, I think um, with, with all of these um, aspects and you know they're not necessarily straight uh, bright line tests that allow us to determine whether uh, a PE exists or not, because they are based on this uh, facts and circumstances type of analysis. Um, one of the, the things that we often look to is the degree of permanency um, of, of what it is that we're observing. You know, is this temporary or is it more permanent? Uh, are we experiencing or witnessing uh, actions or conduct that is habitual in nature? These are the sorts of questions that uh, under the current rules we would look to. And in the, the context of the home office, um, there is also this question of whether or not the home office is at the disposal of the enterprise. So these are the, the key questions under the existing law that is to be considered. And the guidance that we issued was generally uh, in line with what um, tax administrations around the world had already been uh, expressing their view on. And that was because of the unique nature of the, the pandemic, that it was unlikely that these events, uh, in most instances, unlikely that they would trigger a different set of outcomes to what would have been the case uh, before the pandemic. And I think to a, a large extent, that guidance did provide some comfort as, uh, as, as businesses and employers and employees sought to, to deal with the situation uh, that had been thrust upon us. Now, in terms of PE concerns, there is another dimension to this, and that's around the dependent agent PE. And this goes to the question of uh, whether employees located in a, another jurisdiction and during the pandemic, they might have been 
uh, forced to be in a location that they would not typically have been in, uh, and whether or not uh, through uh, habitually concluding contracts or engaging in other uh, regular conduct in that jurisdiction may have also triggered the existence of a PE. And we, we sought to, to clarify uh, these issues and questions in the context of the pandemic. So that's really the, the PE concern, but you can see how uh, moving beyond the pandemic, where we start to look uh, in a scenario where uh, there is not that forced um, or imposed requirement on people to, uh, to, to be locked away in a jurisdiction and not have the ability to, to relocate, uh, where these rules might be interpreted in a different way. And I think to some extent, uh, it's in that space where the debate is very quickly moved and where there is uh, a growing uh, call for further guidance and, and further clarification. So that's PE concerns. Residence concerns are always a, a relevant uh, issue here, both in terms of corporates, and one of the key um, tests that we would consider there is where is the place of effective management? Uh, and that uh, really goes to issues, uh, facts such as where the board members or where the senior executives might be located and where some of the key decisions uh, of the company may be occurring. But then also at the individual level, uh, there is, uh, you know, often these tests around residency can be quite complicated. Uh, they can sometimes uh, overlap and not necessarily uh, be reconciled entirely with uh, across borders. And that's why often we have tiebreaker tie rules that allow you to then determine uh, which is the jurisdiction uh, of residency. But uh, for most individuals, I think the, the general conclusion in the guidance was that um, in the absence of uh, other exceptional circumstances, most of the, the people who would have been affected by uh, the COVID lockdowns and the restrictions on mobility uh, were probably unlikely to see uh, any significant uh, changes in terms of their, uh, of, of their residency. Uh, but of course, uh, once again, that is a, a general statement to make. And just finally, around questions regarding concerns relating to income from employment. Uh, one of the, the key um, elements of, of Article 15 of the, uh, of the model uh, convention uh, goes to this issue of um, where salaries, wages and other remuneration might be taxable. And typically that's in the person's jurisdiction of residence, unless the employment is exercised in the other jurisdiction. And this test around what is exercised really goes to a range of other considerations and, 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 and generally will require one of the following, either that the employee uh, is located there for more than 183 days, and that's probably as close as you get to something in the nature of a, a bright line test in this space, uh, or um, the employer is either a resident of or has a PE in the source jurisdiction. So the guidance uh, worked through these issues and considered uh, them in the context of the pandemic. But as I say, what uh, worked in the pandemic uh, does not necessarily mean um, that, that uh, the same outcomes would be uh, observed uh, in the post-pandemic environment. And I think that's very much the space that we now find ourselves in, in terms of the ongoing debate that we're engaging in. David, that's, uh, that's great. Lots and lots uh, of uh, detail in that, which I'm sure everybody's really appreciated. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Mohammed now, if I, if I may. Um, and the research uh, uses a UAE as a case study, uh, Mohammed, doesn't it? Um, and, and the UAE has emerged as a hotspot uh, for remote cross-border work. So how is your ministry encouraged remote work? And how do these measures fit into a wider strategy on talent attraction and building the UAE uh, as a global business hub? Yes, indeed. Thank you, Keith. Um, uh, for us, the evolution of this trend from where we see it in the UE becoming a remote working hotspot has been like quite remarkable. Um, UE has been a common destination for remote workers for some time, but definitely more so, definitely more prominently post-pandemic. And we first noticed this trend well before the pandemic in the late 2010s. It was specifically with digital nomads and freelancers who were attracted to the UE's great digital infrastructure, connectivity, proximity to other markets, world business hubs, high levels of safety, security, warm climate, uh, high quality of life, among other things. Uh, and at the time, the UAE, I recall, was exploring ways to enhance attracting this specific group of people, which at the time was a relatively niche way of working with, through special visas and, and other measures. Then of course, after the pandemic, remote working became more of the norm than the exception. 
and with it cross-border remote working from our view exploded. Um, I recall when Dubai re reopened its uh, borders to visitors in the summer of 2020 after initial few months, I think, of, of lockdown. We began witnessing more and more people settling and trying to settle here longer term. It was called a working holiday type of arrangement. Uh, and, and to be honest, the other thing the UAE got right very early that helped accelerate this trend was its approach to handling the pandemic uh, with the right balance of public safety measures and frequent testing, while at the same time, allowing people to go about their lives and businesses and avoiding lockdowns. Uh, and so realizing that opportunity that, that was presented, the Dubai government first in 2020 uh, announced this virtual work visa that allowed remote workers to live and reside in Dubai for one year renewable stints. And very soon after that, after seeing the success and uptake of that program in early 2021, the remote working visa, which is now what it's called, was established countrywide across all Emirates. And the eligibility criteria was actually lowered to accommodate more uh, uh, tranches of remote workers. And it's been hugely popular, it's been hugely successful. Uh, but beyond the specific remote working visa, which is obviously aimed at attracting skilled remote workers into the UAE, uh, we've introduced other broader measures in a more comprehensive, wider push for us to de-link employment from residents in our recent immigration and residency law reform. Uh, and, and namely, we've expanded the eligibility criteria and categories for golden visas and introduced what we're calling green visas, both of which are special long-term 10-year and five-year respectively uh, residency permits. It allows their holders to reside in the UAE regardless of their employment status, completely independently from an employer or sponsor. Uh, they're available for several categories of talent from entrepreneurs to inventors, even student graduates, exceptionally skilled persons, investors as well. But for the sake of this discussion, they're also aimed particularly at skilled workers and at the uh, occupation classes of managers, professionals, and associate professionals across all industries and across all sectors, uh, as well as freelancers, I, I should say. And for us, uh, by delinking residents from employment, what we're doing is satisfying the huge and growing demand for this flexibility demanded by skilled digitally enabled workers. And you'll find many UE residents with these visas being employed by or contracted with companies uh, from other jurisdictions. And what we're trying to do with these visas is, is we're actually enabling cross-border remote work in both directions. One, we want UAE-based talent to be able to take on employment in other countries while physically remaining here, because moving jobs between countries no longer necessarily means physically relocating. And two, we also want to allow those who are employed by our UAE companies to be able to work remotely from anywhere in the world for long periods of time without necessarily losing their residency status or residency benefits, and which is why there's a no minimum time spent in country requirement to uphold with these visas. And we're actively encouraging at every encounter uh, uh, with our private sector businesses, advising them to allow this wherever it's feasible and possible. Uh, to shift quickly to your second question on how this uh, fits into our wider strategy on talent attraction and then how that fits into us positioning the UE as a, as a global business hub. Uh, the measures I touched on uh, briefly, uh, they mostly relate to immigration, which is one of the core initiative areas under our strategy for attracting and retaining global talent. Uh, and, and honestly, we've looked at immigration of talent across the entire talent life cycle, as we call it, from education, from when they come as students till retirement. And we actually have made retirement visas available to those seeking to simply come to the UE and retire here. But beyond immigration, uh, the other areas where we're dealing with under our strategy and our initiatives are enhancing the, our labor law and environment. This was featured in the report as well uh, uh, in the executive summary provided by Dr. Seema. Our reformed labor laws and regulations have added flexibility in a lot of areas where it was very needed, uh, introducing official permits for part-time jobs, jobs with flexible and unusual working hours, internships and project-based jobs, uh, working for more than one employer simultaneously, uh, and of course, freelancing, which is even different than that. Uh, another area they address is social security, how we help retain our talent by enhancing their sense of social belonging, long-term stability, even as foreigners working here in the UAE. Uh, and here beyond the long-term residency benefits, which, which in offerings I, I mentioned, we've introduced an unemployment insurance and benefits program for foreign workers, which will come into force in the next few months. And we're also actively looking into developing a pension or retirement savings scheme for foreign workers as they work in the UAE and as they build to or plan to uh, build for their retirement in the UAE. And the last area our initiatives are focused on is data and insight. 
Uh, and our programs here are mainly aimed at understanding talent migration patterns, the drivers behind their immigration decisions, the talent availability issues faced uh, by our businesses, and the future demand for this talent that's required by our businesses in our future economy. This is all to advise the formulation of our policies uh, and here I should mention the UAE government enjoys a very tight, very close relationship to the private sector. Uh, and in fact, our immigration residency law reform recently issued was heavily influenced and driven by private sector stakeholders through many workshops and countless uh, consultations. And, and finally, pivoting back to the second part of the question, of how does all this effort on talent attraction fit in with positioning the UAE as a, as a business hub? Uh, uh, I need to mention that the talent attraction strategy was developed in the early months of the pandemic, and the fact that it was the Ministry of Economy's job in the UAE to put it together is telling. Uh, it was also the first time that talent attraction as a file, as an agenda, was put on the government's agenda as a priority area, uh, with a government minister specifically tasked to lead it forward under the umbrella of the Ministry of Economy. And it, it says two things. Firstly, it speaks to how the UAE sees skilled human capital as lying at the very heart of economic growth and competitiveness, especially as we in the UAE transition to a knowledge-based economy. And we believe that talent, that talent will increasingly become uh, the key contributor to an innovative and technological and economic edge of all nations. And second, it also speaks to the fact that attracting talent and ensuring its availability in the job market goes hand in hand with attracting foreign investment and enhancing that enhancing trade facilitation and enhancing business creation. And we envision the UAE's future economy being one that's a global hub for all these elements put together. Uh, so if you will, the recipe we're aiming for is a virtuous cycle of all these components that have a multiplier effect when put together, and namely creating an enabling business-friendly environment through laws and regulations, attracting the top talent, whether that's physically or virtually, uh, attracting foreign direct investments in key sectors where they're needed to beef up these businesses and uh, creating new market opportunities through international trade and free trade agreements so that the businesses here and the people that are based here can access markets elsewhere and jurisdictions elsewhere and flourish. And, and, and finally, I'll just conclude with a good recent example of where we've tried to hit this nexus. Uh, 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 straight on. Uh, in, in July, in this year, the Ministry of Economy launched a national initiative called Next Gen FDI uh, in partnerships with our banks and our free zones uh, to attract digitally enabled businesses from all over the world. And we provided them with market entry fundamentals to launch and scale from within the UAE. And basically this involved offering them a package all in one that included expediting their licensing and corporation processes, assisting with their bulk visa processing for all their employees, including golden visa granting for all those who sought to relocate with their company, accelerating their banking services and bank account uh, incorporation and providing office space for the companies and residential real estate incentives for their employees. And the program is targeting approximately 300 digitally enabled companies and aims to attract thousands of skilled programmers, data scientists, tech engineers within, ne within the next three years. And so far in the first three months only, about 43 companies have actively been enrolled in this campaign. And I think many are in the final stages of relocating within with their employees uh, to the UAE. And for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just stop there. Well, Mohammed, thanks. And that's a really interesting case study from the UAE. So thanks for sharing that. And people, I'm sure, want to read more about it in the report. I'm going to come to a couple of questions now that we've had in um, via the chat. Uh, I'm going to ask Seema to respond uh, briefly, please, given we've got some pressure on time. So uh, there are two questions here that sort of link together. Has any of the work carried out to date been focused on staff that carry out regulated activity whilst working remotely. And we're assuming that means financial services uh, regulation. And um, at, at EY, what responses are you seeing from UK corporates and banks to enable XB remote working? How is uh, compliance being managed, Seema, please? I'll, I'll take the, the first question um, first. And we did look at regulatory approaches. Um, and of course, um, many of our viewers will know that there was um, there was some talk last year of the FCA looking at you know the operational and legal aspects of cross border remote work. And um, we don't focus on it at, at, in detail um, in the report because we we don't see that there is significant fast movement. Um, but certainly, we do we do pick up on the issue of the regulatory challenges as well um, 
that businesses face, particularly in financial services. Um, in terms of the approaches that we're seeing uh, to enable cross-border remote working, again, in the report, we show a spectrum. So we look at, like I said, we look at the 11 personas, but we also look at the spectrum of responses, which is anything from zero to 180 days. Um, and we also talk about, um, we talked about kind of workforce transformation. And we, we've heard some of our speakers already talking about um, actual transformation of how uh, businesses are looking at global workforces. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and um, defer to the report when you read it for the section on those, those different responses. Okay, that's helpful. Faisan, did you want to cover briefly the CIT aspects there, just so we don't skip over it? Yeah, I think two, two additional points just to add there from a CIT perspective. The first is where there is a regulated function um, and, and the individuals carrying out work are regulated roles. Um, tax very rarely will be the business prevention unit. I think it's first key to understand what the regulatory constraints are and the tax kind of just follows from there. Um, in terms of the responses we're seeing from, from banks and other corporates um, on allowing cross-border working, I think we're seeing an uptick in the number of remote worker policies that people are implementing and organisations are implementing. So that's definitely a theme that's emerging. And I think the second is there is a vast amount of data that organisations hold about around sort of where people are, what they're doing. Um, and, the, and the key from a CIT perspective is to tap into that data and understand where the risk areas are uh, to be able to effectively use the scarce resource within group tax effectively. Um, so I'll pause there given time, but um, but those are a few insights. No, that's 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 excellent, uh, Faisal. Thank you very much. So I'm going to move on to uh, Jigar now. Jigar, uh, you spent a lot of time analysing the rise of anywhere jobs uh, and the future of work. What are the characteristics of anywhere jobs? Uh, how much overlap is there with financial and professional services? And briefly, what strategies should cities and countries employ to attract uh, anywhere jobs? Thanks, Keith. Um, as you said, at the Tony Blair Institute, we spent a lot of time looking at uh, the impact of remote work during the pandemic and what that means. If a, work, if a job can be done from home fully remotely, then it can be done from anywhere. So what we did is we analyzed 800 different occupations and over 100 distinct work-based tasks and activities to come up with three broad characteristics of what we classify as anywhere jobs that can be done anywhere in the world. The first characteristic is that it can be done on a computer and it requires technical expertise, you know, specialist expertise, not just data entry, but actual technical kind of digital based expertise. The second criteria is these roles, anywhere job roles tend to have limited responsibility for decision making. So maybe two to three times per month, the individual might have to make decisions that you know have an impact on, on, on the commercial outcomes for the business, but it's really limited. And so therefore these roles are potentially on the periphery of the core of the business. The third category that we, we, we've identified for, for, for anywhere jobs um, is these roles tend to be asynchronous. Um, yes, they're detailed oriented work. Yes, they're, they're technical and hard work, but they rarely need to be done at the same time as the rest of the business. Um, and so, you know, you don't actually have to be in the same place with other people, except for maybe once or twice a month. Um, and, and, it's, and it's those three characteristics in terms of detailed digital expertise, limited responsibility for just decision making and, and asynchronous work that we decided is classified as anywhere jobs. And what that means for the actual roles that fall in and, and fall out of that is, is there's basically three broad categories of roles. First is financial roles. So we're looking at anything in insurance, reassurance, pension, credit underwriting, um, but also accountants and economists. Um, the second category of roles is tech roles, I ICT roles. So yes, a bit of tech and support, but more importantly, programmers, developers, certain types of data engineers. Um, these are roles that can be done uh, fully remotely and anywhere. The third category is actually creative roles graphic designers, marketing and advertising managers, web designers. Um, so those are the three categories, of, the big categories of roles. So finance roles, tech roles, creative roles that we see, we identify as the big bulk of, of anywhere jobs. And in the UK, what we identify is about one in five, about six million different people hold an anywhere job. Now, not all these individuals would be at risk of their job being moved abroad or are going to be able to work remotely um, for a variety of reasons, many of which 
um, we've, we've already heard. In terms of what can companies, corporate governments do to support this, I, look, I, I think some of the, the, the legal regulatory tax issues have already been discussed in depth, and I won't go over those again because of time. I think the one thing I really want to echo is something you said right at the start, Keith, is it's about livability. Um, you know, are these places livable and desirable to live? One of the other bits of research we've done on the future of work is looking at a range of mobility statistics. Um, you know, how quick are cities across the world rebounding from pandemic era shutdowns? And the cities that have got back to their pre-pandemic uh, levels of, of travel are those that rank highest on livability indexes. So you're looking at Copenhagen, Madrid, and places like that have done really well post-pandemic. The other bit of research coming out, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop here, is showing, at least in the U.S., based on Census Bureau data, the places that have the highest levels of remote work, work from home are inner city urban areas in San Francisco, D.C., Chicago. So, so you know, I think livability is, and, and, and you know, you, as you said, uh, being a destination for residents, I thought it was a great phrase, Keith, and I just wanted to echo that bit again. And it's, um, it, it's something that we need to add to, you know, the cultural soft factors in addition to these hard regulatory factors. Thanks, uh, Jago. And we've done a lot of work on culture and commerce and, and the case to bring the two together to make uh, workplaces and workspaces uh, and locations more attractive. But that's another topic for another day uh, completely. Um, look, I'm going to come to Jennifer now. Jennifer, the CBI, um, I'm sure your members are in a war for talent um, and I would expect that they would welcome extra flexibility. Are you seeing demand for flexibility in particular sectors? Uh, how are firms seeking to boost flexibility and how can firms managing the complex tax and immigration issues in cross-border remote working, um, how are they thinking that through? Yeah, thank you very much, Keith. Well, absolutely. I mean, competition for talent is at an absolute premium. Um, and really, we're seeing that in all sectors. I think it's really uh, interesting that even in very highly mobile uh, roles, sectors with a high proportion of those are still experiencing labour and skill shortages. In fact, we were out just this morning on, uh, as a CBI, looking at um, uh, the risks for firms with access to labour uh, and skills as being a top threat to labour market competitiveness. And about a fifth of firms in uh, professional, uh, technical and uh, IT uh, firms saying that it's one of their highest uh, challenges, just sort of echoing Seema's point. Um, I think in terms of where it's coming from demand the most, uh, that that backdrop of uh, labour and skill shortages means that firms are really wanting to say yes to staff that are asking for cross-border remote working. There is a premium on retaining talent and really there is not a limitation to the sectors in which staff are asking to be able to do cross-border remote, remote working, primarily because uh, the main way in which it is coming out is for these very short term periods uh, where it might be extending a holiday or it might be working while you're visiting family overseas. So it's not people that, tr that are trying to make a, a big lifestyle choice. The predominant driver of the demand is coming from uh, uh, staff that want to make the most of the fact that they can work remotely. And so really, I think it's the nature of the work, the nature of the role that is the most significant determiner of where the demand is coming from uh, as opposed to uh, sector per se but of course from the perspective of how firms are wanting to use remote working and cross-border remote working the opportunity of that for competitive advantage in attraction talent attraction we're absolutely seeing it in some key sectors and I would just really echo what uh, Jager said there I mean of course those sectors have a higher proportion of roles that can be done remotely, um, uh, but, but really it, it is in tech and financial services that we're seeing the highest demand. And I think it's no surprise that it's also in those roles where we're seeing the highest demand for skills. So particularly in uh, app software development roles, AI, engineering, data, cybersecurity, scientist roles. And I think that that really correlates with what Jager just said earlier about um, uh, sort of the categories that he mentioned there about the types of work um, where it is most possible. 
In terms of your question about um, what a staff, uh, sorry, what are firms doing to uh, boost flexibility? I mean, I think the first thing to say is um, it, when we asked uh, our members, uh, what have you done to address labour and skills shortages over the last 12 months? About 70% of financial services, uh, IT professional services firms said that they had expressly uh, implemented uh, increases to flexible working. Now, we didn't drill down on what proportion of that is cross-border working in particular, but what I will say is really where the leading edge firms were is to not have any mandated days in their hybrid working policy. So that really raises the question, well, if I don't need to come into the office at all, then can't I do my work from anywhere? And in fact, locationless work is being uh, recommended um, uh, as something which uh, uh, employers are trying to use to attract, I think, particularly a younger generation, younger cohort of staff that are looking for um, not just work as uh, something which is very uh, bound by place and hours, but something uh, more broadly. Um, what I will say though is, this is hitting up against, I will say intent and employee demand is really hitting up against the reality um, of what employers feel they're able to offer. I mean, Seema's has given a really great overview of some of the compliance challenges that um, firms are facing. And really what it means is that most of our members are just taking uh, a cautious but pragmatic approach. So on average, uh, firms are not worrying about staff working cross-border if it's less than about 20 days. That's not particularly generous, but they're doing that um, really as a, as a way of avoiding what they see as the main challenge around per permanent establishment that we've talked about. Um, and and, and where, where I think we're seeing the, the, the firms that are pushing the most, it's really the big payment firms really trying to compete with some of the large global tech firms where we're seeing policies uh, more like up to 90 days uh, being, being typical there. But what I will say for those types of firms, it's a lot easier, of course, if those businesses already have uh, a, a, an establishment in an overseas jurisdiction. And it's really mainly for those businesses that have a global footprint that are trying to maximize the opportunity uh, for uh, recruitment, attraction and competitive advantage. Briefly then, maybe just on your last, uh, your last question about how are firms thinking through the, the tax and the immigration challenges? The honest answer is they are thinking it through with an abundance of caution. Um, businesses do not like anything which is uh, not giving them certainty and they do not want anything which risks for them uh, some huge compliance and of course, uh, ta tax implications. Um, I will just say sort of anecdotally on that for, for, for really taking it into what's kind of the context for the HR teams, the tax teams working this through is it's really quite antithetical for most of the ways in which businesses are trying to promote flex is devolving as much decision making as possible to managers for what work arrangements look like. And this is an example where actually firms are trying to take in more control because they're having to educate managers of the risks of a manager that wants to be very liberal, wants to engage their staff, say yes to the ability for them to, uh, to, to go and visit a family member, for example, and work around it, is saying, actually, are you aware of the implications around this? And it's not just implications that we've talked about from a regulatory framework, Firms are also concerned about the cybersecurity risks that come with this, some of the engagement risks, the well-being risks, and, and fundamentally thinking about actually, is this a role that can be done uh, remotely and overseas? If you are managing a team, how does that work practically with time zones? If you are client facing, how does that work practically with meeting uh, sort of business obligations? So I, I think just ending there is, I, I think really what, what businesses want in when they're thinking through this is there are certainly a lot of areas that need to change if we are really truly going to embrace the opportunities of of locationless work but I think the primary urgent call that UK employers are making is for the government to act unilaterally in clarity around the tax framework 
And particularly, I think we need to be very clear that hybrid commuters um, do not create a fixed place of uh, business. Um, I think we need to make sure that we extend that threshold of what is reasonable for, for individual individuals to be working in uh, multiple areas. I mean, we, we are recommending that it's any individual that is working less than 120 days, it shouldn't uh, entail permanent establishment. And also, I think we should really have a better definition of what working from home means. And if it is in uh, from a hotel room, a second home, a, you know, a family's uh, home of rem residence or sort of any other temporary accommodation, it's not considered an employer's premises for the purposes of tax. And I think really moving the UK government uh, on that uh, as part of its current open consultation is, is a great early first win for us. Very good. Uh, lots there. Very interesting. Thanks for your uh, perspectives uh, and those of the CBI and its members. Um, Jennifer, much appreciated. Let's move on to get a view from a fintech now. So uh, Oak North Bank, uh, Nick, um, you know, how do these trends resonate with you and how are you responding at Oak North? Uh, do you feel there's a difference between how a fintech recruits and retains its workforce? Than a more traditional firm, um, would you be open to talent based in the UAE, Nick? Great, thanks, thanks, Keith. Um, so yes, look, in terms of how the trends uh, resonate with us, absolutely, I fully um, agree with the the points that have been made by uh, in the report, but also by the the, the panelists on the uh, on the call this afternoon. I think from a uh, a business perspective, having certainty around tax and having certainty around social security to make sure that you're on the right side of the line is is absolutely key. So for us at um, Oak North, I mean, let, let's split it down into three different phases in terms of um, CBRW. So so pre pandemic, um, look, you know, our, our workforce was mainly based here in the UK, predominantly in London in India where we have significant operations or, or in the US where we also have operations. Uh, and we used to attract, particularly in the UK, people from across the world. You know, we, we, we started with the premise that talent lives everywhere and therefore we should try to recruit from everywhere. Um, obviously you've got to get through the, um, the visa situation in the UK. So we had a, a very diverse workforce uh, pre-pandemic, uh, people based here in London from all over the world. And, and we were very, very proud of that. Obviously, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had a number of requests um, from colleagues to be able to go and work remotely cross-border. We were obviously very sympathetic to that. Uh, I think comments from, from panel members, um, from David particularly here, here earlier on, suggested that authorities relax some of the more stringent um, rules uh, around being able to work elsewhere. And we wanted to be able to enable our, our teams to be able to work in other jurisdictions cross border, but to continue to still um, uh, contribute fully to, to Oak North and our development. Um, since the end of the pandemic, um, I guess what we have seen now is probably a new phase that's come in where people are actually very keen and crave to be back together again um, and work with their colleagues and particularly on a um, from a creative uh, perspective as well. I mean, we sense there's a real buzz around our offices, we either here in the UK, in the US or in India where teams are coming back together. So we do support a remote working policy now post, um, post pandemic. Uh, and in certain conditions, we also support cross border remote working, but I would say that's moved on from where we were in the, um, pandemic and we consider cross-border remote working really on a case-by-case -case basis and obviously we've got to be incredibly cognizant of tax social security corporation tax other requirements that are in each of our our jurisdictions so so that's generally where where our positioning is at the moment and that's why the report really resonated with us the, um keith your second question was around um, how do we feel about the difference to, between how fintechs recruit and how traditional firms recruit? So, so if I look, um, if I look at us uh, in in Oak North, we're obviously building new technology and developing new technology, and I guess that contrasts possibly with a more traditional firm where they actually have the technology in place or they have a tried and tested ways of of working. So, our recruitment tends to be very focused on. Um, having a mindset around being able to build, create, um, ideate, test, 
iterate, uh, fail, because <laughs> that does happen, right? Uh, and learn from that failure to succeed going forward in future. So I guess it's a different kind of mindset, I would imagine, from a more traditional firm. And that we have to then try to recruit people who are very are open to those many possibilities, and particularly the possibilities of something not working right, and being agile and quick enough to test, learn, and move on from that. So I'm um, very orientated around customer needs. So I guess that's how we recruit differently than maybe a traditional firm. But we also know that that has to be built into our working conditions. They have to match that, um, you know, that tried and, you know, not a traditional way of recruitment, but looking at how we solve problems and building technology. So we've got to make sure that our working conditions match that and our culture matches that as well. So we're, and we're incredibly cognizant of that. So that's probably for us, the difference between how we recruit and, and maybe how more traditional firms recruit. Um, I mean, look for an example in the UK here, we, we are a bank, right? Absolutely, dual regulated by PRA and FCA. Um, but we're not based in the city, right? We're, we're based here in in um, in, in Soho in in, uh, in London, just off Carnaby Street. So even that's uh, kind of from a UK perspective, a different flavour that, that actually attract, attracts a different kind of mindset here in the UK than maybe traditionally will go and work or want to work in, in the city of London. So, so we do try and build that difference in culture and we do try to um to to attract a different kind of different kind of mindset so just on to your um last question then around would you be open to talent based in the uae look the the, the short answer is i know the uae pretty well um i actually worked there for, for two years at Abu Dhabi, and i know what a fantastic talent a pool of talent there is in the uae both in you know across all of the the seven emirates i mean from an oak north perspective we don't have set up or infrastructure at the moment in the UAE, but that doesn't mean that we won't do in future as we expand our business. Um, so if it makes sense from a business perspective, then yes, abso absolutely, we definitely consider it. At the time being, primarily our focus is on UK, US and India. So, so that's a, probably a, a, a short answer to the, to the UAE question. But personally, I've got fantastic experience working in the UAE and I love my time, uh, time out there. Great place to work and be Thanks. based. Thanks, Nick. Keeping all your options open. I think that's <laughs> the, uh, absolutely the right way to, uh, to be thinking right now. Uh, thanks much. Appreciated, Nick. Um, let's just come back to um, Faisan on, on, on a tax question uh, before we take a couple of other questions that have come in. Uh, on the uh, on the chat, um, uh, Faisan, are there any easy wins um, which could allow better compatibility between the increased uh, cross-border remote working trend and the existing tax framework? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's that's absolutely right. I think Jennifer touched on a couple of those uh, as well. Um, uh, you know, the, the key themes we're hearing um, from this discussion are the international tax framework has not particularly changed um, to take into account the services sector and, and the fact that people like to work more remotely. The way that we allocate taxing rights, as, as David was, was touching on earlier, is simply by reference to residence PE substance uh, and transfer pricing. Um, and so whilst we are seeing a shift away from that, so the, the, the BEPS uh, uh, 2.0 proposals are clearly trying to tax in a different way. Um, ultimately, we have to consider the existing rules to the existing patterns that we find ourselves um, battling with. And so, yeah, I think there are some some very easy wins that, that can be put in there. Um, the, the tests that we look at from a CIT perspective are definitely very subjective. And so the more objectivity we can put in there, the, the better. Um, the main recommendation that we will have would be to put more time-based tests in. So um, whether that's by reference to the length of the period of time that someone could work uh, from their uh, residence or, or the residence of, of a family or friend, um, or looking at sort of a rolling 12 month period for an enterprise, uh, similar to sort of what we see in personal taxes. So some sort of day based threshold, maybe 183 days, maybe 120, but sort of some, something like that. Um, and also potentially looking at aligning the approach that we have in, in the UK, particularly on, on STBVs um, and seeing whether we could do something similar. Uh, for remote workers, again, uh, again, sort of by reference to what is an established market norm. Um, so that's sort of one area where, where we could see some easy wins. Um, the second area is around um, the preparatory and auxiliary exemption. So I think that's been in place for a while, but actually hasn't necessarily been adapted to take into account the way that we work now. So um, there could be some regard for, for example, 
what we would refer to in financial services as, as non-front office roles. If there's a back office function or a middle office function, maybe the PA exemption could be adapted accordingly. Um, we answered a question earlier about sort of regulated activity. Again, if there's unregulated activity for a regulated enterprise, perhaps that could be um, something that the PA exemption could cater for. Um, and then lastly, something I think again Jennifer touched on was um personal visits, um, you know, where, where you visit a country for personal reasons, but actually end up doing a little bit of work. And, you know, I think we're all guilty of, of answering emails on the beach from time to time. And, and it'd be good to understand sort of where that sits against the current current framework within tax and, and having a little bit more objectivity there. And then lastly, I think um, it's very binary in terms of the impact. So if the answer is you have a PE or you've got a residency issue, then then ultimately it's sort of you know, the impact of that is very, um, very harsh and, and sort of one sided, whereas maybe we could assess the impact, uh, maybe have a little bit more around a simplified compliance requirement, potentially that could be something the UK could look at, or, or even something that could be implemented further afield. Um, and also potentially some simplified transfer pricing or simplified reporting that could come from as well, just to again, make it less of a, a heavy hit, uh, if you end up having an inadvertent permanent establishment. And, then, and, and again, just thinking a little bit about ways in which we could structurally avoid having inadvertent PEs. So secondments are something that the market is looking at. But again, there's not a huge amount of guidance around how a secondment or a service level agreement could ensure that actually the right amount is, of tax is paid in each jurisdiction without necessarily having the compliance burden of, of having to register PEs and, and think about your so I think um, that's probably, um, you know, some of the, the easy wins that I could think of. I'm mindful of time and we've got a couple of questions to answer, but, uh, but hopefully, Keith, that gives you a, a bit of food for thought. And, and... Yeah, no, that's great. And of course, this is the start of the conversation here. So there's an awful lot more of this uh, debate and discussion that this research will, uh, can, will, will, will stimulate, I am absolutely sure. Well, it's sticking with the theme of tax. And as you say, uh, Fizan, we've got a couple of questions. Um, if I can come back to David. Um, this question is um, on fiscal policy. How is fiscal policy affected? And do those that work and live in the country risk to bear the extra taxation to make up for those that live and work in different countries or in a different legislation? Or do the do you risk uh, being double taxed, David? Yeah, look, this is a uh, this is definitely a concern that will play out in the, the broader discussion. I think it does depend to some extent on the nature of uh, any changes that might be, uh, might, be, might be advocated or might be under consideration. I think that um, there is some scope uh, for some clarifications and for some uh, additional um, guidance to be provided around particular case studies, some of which we've discussed in the, in the session today. However, if what we're talking about is something more fundamental that actually goes to the question around the reallocation of taxing rights, then I think it becomes a lot more difficult. Um, we've seen in the corporate income tax space how difficult it has been over many years uh, to reach some agreement to, to reform the international tax rules. And, and now we continue to, um, to, to uh, navigate those challenges when we move to the implementation phase. So I think, um, there are, there are many, many uh, elements there. Uh, one point that I'd make is that, um, yes, there's the corporate tax dimension, but I think even larger, looming larger in the minds of many policymakers is um, any impacts on the personal income tax base. Uh, if we think about the personal income tax and social security contributions, if you just take OECD countries, for example, those two revenue sources account for about 50% of total tax. So half of the tax on average that an OECD country collects comes from either personal income tax or social security contributions. The corporate tax only accounts for about 10%. Now, if what we're potentially considering, and I'm not saying we are, but there are many people suggesting that this might be where the discussion should go. If we're talking about reallocating taxing rights where there might be a disconnect between the place where a person is located um, and the place where those tax revenues uh, are, are to be generated, um, then that gives rise to questions around, well, you know, what are the goods and services, the public goods and services that that individual is benefiting from? And are they making an adequate and sufficient contribution to the provision of those services? And, and this becomes, at its heart, 
a question that goes to, to the center of democracy because um, when it comes to the next election, uh, the people who will vote will be the people located in that jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, they will be very focused on the extent to which they are getting, you know, good value uh, for the tax that they're contributing in terms of the public goods and services that government is providing. So I think it's important, any question that goes to the allocation of taxing rights, you know, it really does uh, address this, this, this more fundamental question of who pays and how much they pay. That's very good, David. And a, a big question. Uh, so really quite unfair probably to ask you to <laughs> tackle that in a few minutes, but thanks ever so much indeed. Right, we've got a couple of minutes left. I want to come back to Seema now and ask the obvious question, where does the debate go from here? And just couple it with one final question on the Q&A, and that is how likely is it uh, that we will see real change in cross-border remote working in the near future? Seema, just a couple of minutes of sum up, please. The change is happening now um, and there is, you know, we looked at all of the different component parts to cross-border remote work and the change is happening in those different component parts, but it's not happening in a cohesive way. Um, so the change will come. Um, in the report, we have the global snapshot section where we're looking at where are some of those pockets of good practice globally. So we talk about uh, the UAE, we talk about Portugal, uh, we talk about lots of different examples around innovation in the employment law space and the immigration space. Um, tax, you know, for all the reasons that David has so eloquently put just now is obviously, you know, some of the biggest questions will sit in the in the tax space. Um, so there is no doubt that that change is going to happen. And one of the key messages in the report is um, policymakers cannot bury their heads in the sand. Um, it is harming UK competitiveness, um, but there is a positive way forward. Um, and we hope that the research really informs that discussion um, holistically. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and thank you to our distinguished panel members uh, for contributing to such a rich discussion on a really, really important topic. Thank you also uh, to you for your questions. Cross-border remote working poses opportunities and challenges for London, as I said at the beginning. That's why I'm really pleased that we've got this excellent research to help guide us. Uh, as I said, today's findings have been a preview that uh, we've shared with you uh, and we'll email the full findings to you in a few days time. Um, I'd like this to be the start of the conversation, not the end of course. So if you'd like to discuss these issues, then please do get in touch with the team here. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and goodbye.